Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to cover tax saving tips for my notary signing agents out there. This one I love to talk about because let's face it, wouldn't we rather keep our money for us, for our family and our investments and our kids instead of giving it to the government? Absolutely. So in this video, I'm going to show you everything that I know and can share about how to do just that to the penny so you can save more money for you. Now, if you love great notary signing agent content, entrepreneurship, investing, this is a channel for you. Please subscribe if you love this type of content so we can continue putting out more content that will save you more money to leave a bigger legacy for your family. Now, also in today's video, I'm going to cover a lot of different topics from starting the business from legal formation perspective up until deductions. And I do want to preface the video right now and cover my legal butt by saying I am not a CPA. I'm also not an attorney. The advice I'm going to give you in this video is practices that have worked for me and my business and check all the boxes for the research I have done to verify that they are actual okay deductions to do per IRS code. However, that doesn't excuse you from doing your own due diligence and working with a qualified CPA or sometimes an attorney if we're talking about legal structure to investigate these things on your own. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to the good stuff. How can we save more money to keep for ourselves as a notary signing agent? So from the beginning, should I do an EIN, an LLC? I'm not sure if I'm getting started, what I should do. So what I suggest, and this is up to you, but if you're doing a notary signing agent as a side hustle and you're just trying to testing the waters then typically I suggest to people to not spend too much as they're going down this path so save money where you can right so obviously you can't skip having a printer but of course you can save a little bit in formation costs of an LLC because if you do that depending on your state there's going to be number one a formation cost to create the LLC and ongoing annual fees typically most states will charge to maintain the LLC so if you're just getting started my suggestion would be if you're filling out a bunch of W-9s to submit to signing services, get an EIN uh, or an employee ID number that you can actually use instead of your social security number on these W-9s as you're sending them out to hundreds of potentially signing services to work with you. That way your social isn't floating out there. So that's just personal preference. Very easy to do. You can do it for free. Do not pay for this service. Just go to the IRS website and just type in get an EIN and that can literally be done in minutes. So once the EIN is uh, sent to you from the IRS, us to save that in your folder for all of your important notary information and you have it as a reference. So use that in place. Now, LLC, if you do decide to create an LLC, you're more serious, fantastic. I personally prefer to do an LLC because when I start a new business, I am going all in. I'm not going to tip, dip my toe. I'm going to put some effort into it because what's the point of doing it half ass? You know, I can't really find out if this is going to be good until I really give it a go and put a lot of time and effort into it. So I do LLC for a couple reasons. One, there's liability I'm trying to shield my family from. Now, of course, in this scenario, you have zero assets and zero family and nothing to lose, then you probably don't need an LLC because there's nothing if you were to lose a judgment that anyone can take from you, financially speaking anyway. But if you do have assets to lose and family to protect, that's why I use the umbrella of an LLC or limited liability company. And I also understand that I have to treat it like an LLC, like a separate business, or that corporate veil could be pierced if you have an attorney on the other side that can argue it. So how, what do I mean by that? So you have to treat the business like a business. So you have to have a separate bank account and all the transactions in that business bank account can only be business transactions. There can't be personal transactions mixed in there because then a great attorney would argue that that you weren't actually treating like a business, you were running personal transactions through it. So business bank account, important, and stick to business only transactions in that account. So that's why I do LLC for the extra asset protection because I have a house, I have houses, I have cars, I have family to protect in case something goes wrong. So that's what it's there for. So get your business bank account when you set up your LLC. When you're setting up your LLC, again, you do not have to pay anyone to do this. You can if you want to, but it is not required. You can again, go to the IRS website to get the EIN after you've created the LLC for your state. Now, how to do that, you can literally go to your state's Secretary of State website and uh, figure this out or Google form an LLC in Maryland, Texas, Florida, whatever state you're in, and you will walk through that process. Usually very straightforward. You have to fill it out online, several buttons to click. Are you the owner? Are you the member? What's the mailing address for the business? What type of business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It walk, it's relatively user-friendly depending on your state. So you can get that set up. And then there's a minimal fee at the end to create the LLC, again, depending on your state. Then once it's created, the state will give you articles of organization for that LLC that you take, print out and take to the bank that you're going to open the business bank account, assuming it's a physical bank or email if it's an online bank. That's all you need. Now you can also, while you're there, create an operating agreement if you want to do that as well. If you're a single member LLC, 
not as important. There's multiple members, definitely have an operating agreement. Separate discussion, separate video for another time. Moving on. Okay, great. EIN, LLC, we covered that. LLC taxed as an S Corp. So some people bring this question up, should I form an S Corp or have my LLC taxed as an S Corp? Great question. Now, the benefits of the S Corp, and again, I'm not gonna get too deep down this rabbit hole, even though I, I love talking about saving money. The benefits of the S Corp are, when you have a certain level of profit, this S Corp strategy will help allow you to take more deductions to save even more money. So what do I mean by that? So let's say in your notary signing agent business, you're going to have gross revenue of 100,000 and profit of maybe let's say 70,000 or more. In that scenario, it probably would make great sense to have your LLC taxes an S Corp because you can take two additional huge deductions to help reduce that net profit. One is gonna be paying yourself via payroll. So, and where that saves you is, let's say you pay yourself a reasonable salary of $30,000 and you do have to pay uh, employee taxes on that. However, as that comes out of your paycheck every two weeks, but you're not paying the employer side of those taxes, which is saving you 15%, so 15% on that 30K or that 50K or whatever you decide to pay yourself as a reasonable salary, right? So you save that 15%, great. And the other nice thing about the S Corp is you can establish an accountable plan where the, basically it's very simple. You set it up for the business so that the rules of the business are any expenses incurred by employees on behalf of the business are reimbursed as long as they're submitted in a timely manner, 60 days or less from the time of actual expense occurring. And they are itemized with a, with a receipt, detailed itemized receipt and tracked. So so in that case, what happens is as you, the employee in the S Corp are incurring expenses on behalf of the business, like business mileage deductions, that is a massive expense you'd be incurring on behalf of the business that you would be reimbursed for on a monthly basis. And things like that will help you dramatically reduce the net profit of the business because it's just considered an employee um, expense that you're reimbursing on a monthly basis. So that helps reduce the overall net profit of the business between the payroll you take, paying yourself and the employee expenses. So that reduces the overall net profit of the total business and you're saving the self-employment tax on whatever you pay yourself as a salary. So that starts to add up. Now the downside to having the LLC tax as an S Corp, you do have to do a separate tax return at the end of the year called a K-1. And this is where you wanna have a great CPA especially a CPA that specializes in just working with business owners. If you're curious, I can always recommend mine. I love him. He only works with business owners and real estate investors, and that's what he deals with. So that is his niche, his lane, his expertise. So that's what I would suggest. Find someone, interview someone that is very good at that one niche because it's important. The knowledge they have will save you a ton of money and also help you keep you compliant and also give you different ideas that you can execute throughout the year as far as other tax saving strategies as you go further along in your entrepreneurial journey. So rabbit hole, we went down too far, but S Corp makes sense if you have a high enough level of profit that it definitely does make sense. Next, uh, actual deduction, we're gonna get into in a second, but right before that, we wanna have accounting software in place. Now, most notaries will be sufficient if they use a accounting software specific to notaries like Notary Gadget or Notary Assist. I personally have used Notary Gadget for years, so I can speak to that directly. So that is perfect because it keeps track of your customers or clients, any notes about them, all the signings that are attributed to them. So it keeps track of all your revenue and then obviously it gives you places to keep track of your expenses throughout the year, add in your receipts. And at the end, it also allows you to, to produce reports that you can submit to your accountant, you know, profit and loss reports. It doesn't have any additional reports like a statement of cash flows or balance sheet. So keep that in mind. Uh, so if you do the S Corp strategy, you will have to have another other software it's a little bit more robust like QuickBooks or Xero. I personally use Xero as well. Xero is spelled X-E-R-O. In addition to the notary gadget, uh, that way I have the, the full reporting I want and can submit to my accountant. And uh, so that's my preference. But anyway, notary gadget, for the most part, you're doing a single member LLC or flow through LLC where your income to the LLC flows right to your 1040. Notary gadget will be more than enough and perfect. It is detailed and is designed specifically for notaries, which I love. Now it does have a couple downsides besides the reporting that I mentioned. The other part of it is it has a spot for each of your notary appointments to track the mileage, which is nice. However, where it's limited is that it only tracks the mileage from assuming you're driving from your house to that appointment address and then back. So you're like, well, that's enough, right? Well, not quite, because there's other business miles that you're gonna to need to track. So from your house, assuming you're leaving the house, because not always is the case, you may be driving different places. So assuming we're starting off with a false assumption, normally you're gonna be on the road as you get busier, not 
driving straight from home every time. So that, and then also once the appointment's done, you typically have scan backs a lot of times, or you might have to stop and do that. And then if you're driving to FedEx or UPS or back to the title office, that's business mileage because it's mileage incurred as you're conducting your business. And then there's also mileage not in uh, in relation to appointments, but whenever you're going out to marketing, that is business mileage. So how do you track that? So that's why I suggest using an app like Mile IQ, which I love and I've used for probably, I don't know, five, six years at this point. Love it, tracks every single drive in a car that you occur because it tracks it via GPS. And all you simply do is at the end of the week, it sends you an email, hey, you forgot to track your drives this week or some of your drives. Open the app, swipe left for personal, swipe right for business, that's it. It is that simple. And then at the end of the month, you'll get a monthly report that you can store away and update your accounting. Now, with Mile IQ, the caveat is with business mileage, if we're doing the mileage, the other option is to do actual cost of your vehicle, which most of the time never makes sense as an notary signing agent, unless you're deducting the whole vehicle as a business write-off. Um, then in that case, you're deducting a lot of it in year one in the first few years for straight line depreciation. Then doing actual costs, you wouldn't bother with mileage. You would cover everything actually costing you with the vehicle, like all the vehicle maintenance, the interest on the loan if you have one, or lease payment if you have one, the uh, all the uh, car washes, uh, the car insurance, all that for the car you would expense on a monthly basis uh, and track on a monthly basis. But most everyone is in the mileage category, makes more sense, the simple deduction, because we drive so much. So this tends to be the largest expense we incur on an annual basis. However, there is a small rule in there about uh, the IRS about tracking uh, business trips or business mileage. Technically the first uh, drive from your house to the first place you're working or your job is typically called the commute and the commute is not deductible or your first commute of the day. However, if you have a home office, your commute actually becomes your, in my case, the home office we're filming in is in the basement. So I'm literally, my commute is when I wake up every day, I'm walking from my bedroom to the main floor to the home office. That is my commute to work every day because I have a home office that I deduct and track every year. That's my commute. Then when I drive out to wherever the first drive, that is deductible because I've already commuted to work, which is the home office. And now I'm going out to my first appointment. So also why you want to have a home office. I'll get into that in a second. So cool. EIN LLC accounting software now deductions. Now, We'll hit these relatively fast. Deductions that are common are gonna be, start with notarial income. So any income you receive from notarial acts specifically, based on your state's guideline, are exempt from self-employment tax. So that ends up being about 15.3% of money you could save. The downside is if you're saving that and not uh, claiming that income, obviously you're not paying social security so that you could potentially be paid later you know, into social security. However, let's be real. Number one, when you retire, social security is probably gone. If it is great, if it's there, great, fantastic. Number two, I don't want to pay into it because I am not relying on social security at all. I'm assuming it will be gone. And if it is there, it's like, you know, going out to eat money. It's not, you're not going to live on this money. If you do, you know, you're, you're in bad shape. Okay. So, um, you know, if that's your case, I'm sorry, but if you're living off social security, you're going to be in trouble. So I don't expect it to be there for me. I want all my money to go towards my investments that do pay me significant amounts of money now, not when I'm retired. So that's why I don't care about that. So any income incurred throughout the year. So let's just say you make a round number purposes $100,000 as a notary signing agent. And per your state's laws, I actually could have charged $30,000 based on the notarial acts, or in my case, the stamps that I would have incurred. So I am actually not paying self-employment on that 30K that I incurred as an, a notary public or an official of the state. This is in the IRS tax code. It's very small, but you can find it because I found it on Google and going to the IRS website, but it is exempt. So you will have to probably help your CPA if they're not a business CPA about exactly where to put it. But there is a spot on your return where you write exempt and that dollar amount, and that's where you note it. Uh, I'd have to check my actual return from the prior years to tell you the exact spot, but it is there, I promise you, and it's in the IRS code. So that's lovely. Um, so in my state, Maryland, as I'm filming it, they just increased Notarial Act fees this month, so we can actually charge $8 per Notarial Act before it was six that, before it was four. Some states are as low as $2, some states are as high as $15 for in-person Notarial Acts. Online Notarial Acts are $30 in my state, uh, so it's gonna depend on your state, but that could be a big number you're not paying self-employment tax on which is lovely. So you wanna keep track of that. That's why Notary Gadget is great because you will enter your notarial acts per appointment and it adds all that up for you. 
Just make sure it's accurate. The dollar amount is accurate for your state when you're inputting it. Next is going to be your home office deduction. So this one is often overlooked, but you want to include this because number one, as I mentioned before, if you have a home office that you're deducting, that counts as your commute to work from your bed to your home office, wherever that is in your house. That way your first drive is deductible because it is a business drive. Secondly, there's a couple ways to deduct home office. You can either do the simplified method where it's, I believe it's $5 per square foot of your total home office or the total square footage method. So let's just say, again, round number purposes, your home office is 500 square feet and the total square footage of your house is 2000 square feet. So uh, 500 into 2000 is 25%. So you'd be able to deduct 25% of the home office expenses. So expenses you normally incur living in a home that the IRS will allow you to deduct. And there's a long list. And in the description below, I'm going to list the form that I use each year to keep track of my home office expenses. Uh, that way it's right there there for you. Uh, you're welcome. But it will obviously and you can't deduct land. So this is and you'll see it when you look at the, the document, but it's basically the home value minus the land because land never gets appreciated. So you got the value of the home dollar amount. And let's say you're taking 25% of that. Um, so that ends up being a large number as far as uh, everything you can deduct. And you can also include things like your mortgage interest, not the mortgage, but the mortgage interest. If you have a mortgage on the property, your homeowner's insurance, property taxes, HOA fees, repairs and maintenance, cleaning, landscaping, only if your um, clients actually come to your house. If they don't, then you can't include landscaping as well as utilities. So things you're going to pay for anyway, you get to deduct a nice chunk of it as your home office because a portion of your house is being used for business and that portion alone gets used for business. So there is a deduct deduction there. However, keep in mind, whatever your home office area is, just make sure that it is dedicated for business only. You don't co-mingle, as I mentioned. So in your home office space, you don't have a bed. So obviously, because you don't want people to think you're sleeping there. But again, business only great deduction i have it every year i'll link that uh, form in the description below if you want to use it fantastic next is going to be advertising costs so if you're advertising or marketing i put everything under advertising so it's very easy to drop in that bucket so anything related to marketing so anything related to marketing where you're marketing to try to get new clients so that's going to include any expenses related to networking events um if you are going to offices or realtor events or lenders and bringing them goodie baskets or goodie bags or gift bags uh, as well as obviously any any ads on any of the platforms for your notary business. So any advertising at all, marketing is going to go in that bucket. Next is going to be accounting. So accounting, anything that's going to be associated with that will be whatever you're paying your account every year to file your taxes. And then any accounting softwares like Notary Gadget or Zero or QuickBooks. Next, you got continuing education. So I love this one because I attend typically at least once a year, the Loan Signing System Conference. That's continuing education for my business to get better. Very common and expected for you to get continuing education in your business so that you can improve yourself. I also include my monthly Audible deduction in there or my monthly Audible fee. And all I listen to an Audible is all business. There is no personal stuff. It's all personal development, business development, sales, marketing, trainings about um, ways to improve myself as a leader and as a business owner and an entrepreneur. Next after continuing ed is dues and subscriptions. So typically whatever doesn't go in the other categories will typically fall in here that you're paying on a monthly basis. So that may be, you know, if you're having a, a subscription to Zoom, or that could be your LLC annual fees throughout the year. Uh, if you have any video editing, peep, uh, video editing uh, software apps that you use, Nix captions, CapCut, things like that would go in there. Um, platform fees to the platforms you're on. So whether it's a monthly fee to the platform that you're working on, like Blue Notary, or platform fees that they charge you when they charge you at the end of the month for all the stamps you did, like Notarize does, you can do that as well. And then Notary Act, your electronic journal, I put that in there as well. So any normal dues and subscriptions would go in there that are on a monthly basis recurring. And then next is going to be office expenses. This is typically a big one. This is where you have your equipment, printer, scanner, your office supplies, like your letter and legal paper, your blue pens, your paper clips, everything office supplies related will go in there. Your calendars, whatever helps you keep you organized, all that stuff, uh, your notary stamps, all that good stuff. And then office expenses, that should be about it. Uh, the only thing I didn't cover so far would be the uh, things like background check, errors and emissions insurance, obviously errors and emissions insurance that can go in insurance and background check that could go into dues and subscriptions. And then the last two I'm going to touch on are tolls and parking. So obviously, depending on where you're conducting signings, you may run into uh, having to pay for parking if it's a garage or if it's in street parking, but you're in a large metro area, that's deductible. And then tolls, 
obviously if you have an easy pass like we have in Maryland or something similar where you have it tracking as you're going through tolls, you get an annual or monthly report, I should say. Those are all deductible, assuming that they were business uh, related tolls, not personal tolls. And then lastly is travel. So travel expenses, so that would include airfare, eating, uh, you know, uh, lodging, any meals when I'm on business trips specifically. And obviously check the IRS um, current code for all the rules you have to follow it's for a business trip to be considered a business trip. Typically you're spending at least four plus hours a day on a weekday for it to be a business trip in business. Um, and then obviously you want to take detailed notes when you have meetings or what you did on that business trip so you can show proof. Because usually travel deductions, they tend to be larger because you're combining airfare, hotel, meals, rental cars, um, Ubers, whatever, and it kind of stacks up a little bit. So you want to make sure you can document it and have a record of it. So if you're ever called on it, you can say, yes, I spent this day doing Doing this, this day doing that, this day doing this, and more than 50% of the time was actual business. The nice thing is the other 40% of the time that wasn't business was you hopefully, you know, doing fun things uh, in a vacation area and enjoying yourself. So that's the nice thing about it. So we have covered a ton of deductions. I hope that helped give you some ideas about things that you can deduct that you may not be currently deducting so you can save more money for your family. Hopefully that helped at the beginning talking about EIN, LLC, taxes and S-Corp. Hopefully that helped answer some questions there. And I hope this video gave you tremendous value and you can save more money to keep for your family and invest and do whatever you want to do with it instead of giving it to the government to misspend it terribly. <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and I will let you know that we do have an offer I do want to let you know about. It's in the description of our videos. If you don't catch it on this video, it's typically there on our notary videos. But if you don't know already, I own a national signing service, Superlative of Signings. We do an incredible job taking care of our clients throughout the country and we provide in-person closings, remote online notarization closings, U.S. citizens, foreign nationals, bilingual closers. We vet really heavily before we hire because that's important to us to make sure we have a trained closer that can walk someone through an Alta line by line and summarize documents. And on the back end, we do full scans on every file that we approve quickly for my notaries out there. So you're not waiting and on the hook in real time, it gives you the thumbs up or the small corrections we have to make. And then we drop same day FedEx UPS and we track that three times a day because we want our clients to get their documents the next day. So they're well taken care of. We do an amazing job for our clients throughout the country. And if you are notary signing agent that has direct clients, but you're not interested, repeat, not interested in starting a signing service nationwide like ours. And that is not something that you care to do because you don't want to hire out a team and go through that headache. I get it. It is a pain sometimes. If you are not going to do that, but you have direct clients and you want to earn extra money by doing nothing, listen up. Okay. If you refer your direct title clients to our signing service and they use us, whether that's one time or all the time, we we will pay you 10% recurring commission on all sales that they spend with us. So what does that mean in real terms? Let's just say you refer us a direct title client and they pay us one invoice of one signing at $150 and that's it. They try us out once and that's it. They go back to whoever they were using. It's not likely to happen, but let's just say it is 10% of 150 bucks is 15 bucks. We will direct deposit you 15 bucks. Not that exciting, right? However, stretch those numbers out if they give us 100 closings or 500 closings and then run the numbers, we will pay you again, 10% on whatever it is they bring us with no cap. And why would we do that? Well, number one, we're getting, getting introduced to title companies we might not already get introduced to depending on where we're advertising and where we have sales reps in the country. Number two, you're giving us a warm intro with someone they trust. And we don't take that trust lightly. As I mentioned, you can check our Google reviews, sign this. Uh, at the time of this recording, we have about 104 five-star Google reviews. So we take great care of our clients and our notaries and our team. And we stand by that work. Our clients love us. They tend to never leave us, but we always could use more help. So that's where you can come in if you want to get paid 10% for referring us and doing no work. And we literally will direct deposit into your account every single month because to us, it's a win. To you, it should be a win. Your clients, it's a win. Our team, it's a win. It's a win all around. So if you're interested, please, all you have to do is introduce us via email, brad at signings.com. Again, that info is in the description of the video if you want to check out that offer. And we would be happy to take great care of your clients because that's all we do every day, each day. So I appreciate you staying tuned until the end. And I hope you got tremendous value from this video. Save more on taxes to save for your family. And until the next video, guys, love you. Appreciate you. Peace.